Okay, so let's begin. Uh, welcome to the first day of the rest of the semester. Uh, so obviously there's been a lot of changes and we'll uh, take some time to adjust to this new sort of paradigm. Um, but so basically what we're doing now is we're not having, or you should have gotten some emails from Martina and Tabes. Um, so we're not having a midterm or uh, a final. We're basically uh, dividing up the rest of the semester into modules. And then there will be, rather than having tests, we'll have sort of weekly assignments in addition to your, your regular online and written homeworks. Okay, so there will be, let's see. So, right, so we'll be testing on five modules. So the first module testing will start next week. Um, each module will have two components, which is each worth 5% of the grade. So these five sort of module tests will be, will, will basically round out the 50% that remains um, on your grade, right? And there will be two kind of tests each week. One will be a written uh, test that will be submitted to Gradescope. So this will be like open book. It'll be somewhat similar to your written homeworks, uh, but we'll be looking at, at more for y'all to explain, like really explain conceptually uh, what you're doing and to justify your answers. So there'll be one of those uh, each week starting next week, which is worth 5%. And then there will also be a My Math Lab quiz, essentially. Okay. And there will be, these will be posted like every week and you'll have a certain amount of time uh, with which to work on them. And we'll, we'll give you more like information on that as it goes. Okay, so let's see. Um, on the uh, classes starting now, I suppose you could say. Um, yeah, this is class. <laughs> yeah, they're like mini quizzes kind of. Um, basically, we're taking it like week week by week. Like we'll, we'll do, we'll probably lecture mostly on Monday and Wednesday. Uh, your, your, um, Discussions will be online as well. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, we'll review stuff on Friday, probably. And then you'll like the next week, you'll be tested on, on the material that we went over. OK. Um, your discussions will be online as well. The module will not be during the lecture. It'll be posted, and then you'll have some, some set amount of time um, I believe like 24 or 36 hours to submit it to Gradescope. So it'll, it'll be kind of like a written homework um, that you have um, like a, a short amount of time to submit it. There will not be a test this week. No. So there's no there's no like midterm. Um, you can write it on just loose leaf paper and submit that to um, Gradescope. The so like half the quizzes will be submitted to Gradescope, half the quizzes will be in my math lab, and you'll have some amount of time with which to start those. Uh, yeah, the discussion sections are the same. Yeah, and every TA should have will have sessions on on um, on the Blackboard Collaborate as well. So there's no midterm this week, correct? There will not be attendance. Uh, probably we will not be taking attendance at all. Um, and probably we'll be dropping the attendance uh, policy altogether. There will be, there is no final. Okay, any other questions? I know this is a lot. Um, and it'll, it'll become more clear throughout the week, sort of how this will run. Uh, but generally I'll post uh, my day as well, thank you. Um, generally, I will post, oh yeah, office hours, okay, okay. Office hours is, uh, office hours we at the same time basically just online on this Blackboard um, thing. So four to five on Monday and Wednesday, I'll be, um, on, I'll be on Blackboard Collaborate. So I'll probably just keep this room open basically for an hour after the class and, <clears throat> and you can ask any questions that you like. Mm, thank you. Uh, all right. 
keep keep the memeing to a minimum, please. This is very serious. OK, uh, the grading. So the grading will be that there will be five modules starting next week that will each be worth 10%. That 10% is divided between two different assignments. Uh, there will, we'll, we'll post like sort of a practice uh, module like later this week, so you'll see what to expect. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll definitely let you know like what will be on each one. Yeah, it'll be timed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll be timed. Yeah, yeah, it'll be timed. Like you'll have so like the the written part will be you'll have so many um, hours to submit it. It'll be posted on a given day, and then you'll have thirty six hours or something like that to submit it to um, GradeScope. So if you haven't used GradeScope. Uh, well, if, if, if you took 121 last semester, you probably used Gradescope, which it seems a lot of y'all did. If not, like more information on that will be coming. Yeah, each module will be about a week. Uh, yes, Joe, you can't hear me, but I am speaking. Um, uh, Uh, how much help you can ask will, I guess, will be determined. It will probably just be to clarify questions. Um, but it will be open note and everything. <laughs> um, I am only now, like, hearing about the credit system. So there, I think the university is offering classes on a credit, no credit basis. But to be honest, I'm not um, too sure about that. Yeah. Okay. It'll it'll all be it'll all become come clear in the next week, guys. We'll we'll figure it out. You'll you'll get more information on um, the module assignments. Essentially, the the idea is that <laughs> essentially the idea is that um, there won't be a midterm or a final. Instead, we'll have like five smaller assessments. Okay. Don't don't worry about the credit system, or you'll you'll hear about that more to come. All right, so let's see, any other questions? Uh, uh, okay, well, send me an email about the My Math Lab. No, we're, and I'll, um, I'll look into that. Uh, no, we're not using Acadly anymore. No assignments were due over spring break, correct? Indeed, rip. OK, so the way these will work right now is um, um, <clears throat> my cat's jumping on the table, is I will post uh, like sort of the lecture sheets to Blackboard before class. And then we'll kind of we'll go over them in class and we'll try we'll try to run this the same way. All right. Uh, the department gave me a tablet, so I'll try to write on this, um, but it might take some some getting used to. OK. Yes, apps in the chat. Welcome to my Twitch stream. Uh, can I show you my cat? Maybe later. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> th this current lecture sheet is posted to, yeah, indeed. This current lecture sheet is posted to, um, is posted to Blackboard. All right, also on Blackboard under announcements is, is a big write-up that's got that is basically, you know, how the grading will be done for the rest of the class. Okay, so let's let's begin. Um, so we're going to review optimization since that sort of got lost in the fray uh, with the university closing down and everything. And it also is the subject of the the next written homework that's due. So there is a written homework uh, due on Thursday. Uh, you you may see my face again. It's to be determined. I don't know. The room's pretty dirty. All right. So looking at this first question, it says that a rancher plans to make four identical and adjacent rectangular pins against a barn, each with an area of 100 square meters. What are the dimensions of each pin that minimize the amount of fence that must be used? OK, so let's see if this drawing works. Uh, 
Uh, can I zoom in? Yes. I think you can zoom in on your own. Uh, yeah, they are being recorded. That's correct. OK, so let's see. So four identical pins, uh, identical and adjacent rectangular pins against the barn, each with an area of 100 square meters. What are the dimensions of each pin that minimize the amount of fence that must be used? OK, so we have a picture here with the barn is on the left and the four square pins to the right. All right, so we did this by, um, or we proceeded to label things. So I could call the length x and the height of the full pin um, y. Then the area, this is not too pretty. So let's see. So what is what is the area of the the full like four pins together in terms of x and y? <laughs> see if you can answer that in the chat. X times y, indeed. Thank you. All right, x times y. Good, good, good. So the area of the full, the way I've labeled this, I'm using Y to represent the full length on the side. And I'm, I'm pointing to my screen, but you can't see me point to my screen. Uh, difficult. OK, so the area in terms of the variables we've used here is X times Y. Uh, yes, Sav, you have your hand up. All right, they tell us that each has an area of 100 square meters. All right, so the way we've drawn this, we don't really need to like break it up into that, but if there's four of them and they each have an area of 100 square meters, we can say that the area must be 400. Okay, what we're trying to minimize then is the amount of fencing that's used, all right? So we need to come up with an equation um, for the amount of fencing in terms of X and Y, all right? So if you note, there would be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five lengths of length x. OK, good. There are five lines. All right. And there's only actually one length, uh, one side length of length y, because the barn, sort of the side of the barn, represents the other side. So we're not using the um, that side. So 400 comes from the fact that each of the pins is 100 square meters. So the, there's four pins, so the total would be 400. All right. So the total amount of fencing is 5x plus y. Man, this is really nasty. All right, so that says 5x plus y. OK, and we want to minimize this. All right, we want to find out um, the least amount of fencing that we need. All right, so to y plus y because of the, the, length, the side of length y on the right. So the way this fencing is done, the, the left side of this picture is just the barn. So there's no fence on that side per se. And then I build the pins against it. All right. So the way we've drawn this, there's five lengths of, or there's five like sides of length x, and there's one side of length y. Yes, I, I am using a touch pin. I think it's just this this Blackboard app is not too great. I'll try to um, find a different app and see if I can share that share that screen with y'all. Right, yeah, so I'm looking at the perimeter. We're trying to minimize the the perimeter. Uh, no no bathroom breaks. Sorry. Um, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, you can eat though. That's fine. That's, that's allowed. 
Um, so let's see. All right, so we're trying to minimize the fence. So, so right now it's written in terms of two variables, but we want it to be written in terms of a single variable. All right, so we can use the first equation to solve for either variable. All right, so let's say we solve for y. All right, so if we, I have, I have the um, condition that x times y is 400. All right, so I can use that to solve for y. So let's see. Okay, and now I can plug this back into my to my um, equation for the perimeter. All right, so it was I wrote fence. Let's just call it f of x, since it'll now be an equation just um, in the variable x. So it'll be five x plus. Four hundred over x. All right, and we're trying to to minimize this. So now that we have an equation of a single variable, um, we just want to we just want to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. We're just trying to find uh, a critical point. All right. So let's see. I want to try to try a poll. All All right, so what is the derivative? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, my keyboard's pretty, it's like pretty loud. Let's see, what is the derivative of 5x? Man. <laughs> I do have a Chroma Razor keyboard, indeed. Uh, they change colors. I forget what cherry means. <laughs> right, right, right. I have a Corsair mouse. My gamer specs. Okay, so most most people got this correct. The derivative of five x is indeed five. Uh, not shoot, my KD on COD is pretty bad. If I'm being honest, getting old. All right. So the derivative of five x is five. All right, and the derivative of four hundred over x. So we can think about this as uh, x to the negative one, right? And then when you take the derivative, you just use the power rule. And you'll end up getting minus 400 over x squared. Yes, it's minus 400. Um, because the 400 over x, you can think of as 400 times x to the negative first power. So let's see if I have room to write this. Hmm. 
I know the handwriting's pretty bad. I'll I'll try to use an app, or maybe on the next question I, I can open up this app and we'll see what it looks like. Yeah, so that's four hundred x to the negative first. I, I have a pen. All right. Um. Okay. So. All right. So we have the derivative now, and we want to set it equal to zero to find the critical points. Don't know what happened there. Um, let's see. So you'll end up with x squared equals four hundred over five. which is 80. So we set it equal to zero because we're trying to find a critical point, right? So we're trying to find like a local minimum or a local maximum. All right, so then you would take the square root since this is a physical quantity, it's the length of a fence. You only care about the positive root, so you get that x is equal to the square root of 80. All right, and then to find y, we have that y is 400 over x. All right, so you get y is Four hundred divided by oh, <laughs> the square root of eighty. Okay, so how could we how could we test if this is actually a local minimum? What was one way of doing that? Sign chart, indeed. Good. So I'm not going to do that here because I'm kind of running out of room. But right, we could use the sign chart. So you would test one value uh, to the left or right of the square root of 80. And you would see that it was a negative derivative to the left and a positive derivative on the bottom. Or sorry, to the right. Okay. Which means that you have a local min. Okay. So one second. Yeah, I can I can like write um, I printed out all, yeah I can like write this stuff out and and um, I'll post like written solutions uh, on Blackboard that's that's a lot more clear okay all right so I want to try something I want to like just share my screen and use this other app and see if it works better um, the only thing is I won't be the chat all right but we'll see. Um, I can go back to the chat. It's okay. It's about to turn into the matrix. Did it work? Okay, so I think you should all be able to see my screen, which is the same, um, the same review. It's just on a different app now, which I think has, is a little better for the pin, all right? So the second question says that of all boxes with a square base and a volume of eight cubic meters, what is which has the minimal surface area? Okay. So there will be two equations we'll use here, the volume of a box and the surface area of a box. The volume is our constraint equation where, where 
um, relegated to having a box of eight cubic meters, and we want to minimize the surface area. All right, so let's see how well I can draw a box. Ooh, isn't that nice? OK, so this box has a square base, which is labeled two of the sides x, and the other side I've labeled h. Right? So there's, there's three lengths involved in like a box. Right? There's length, width, and height. OK, so it's the, the two on the base I've labeled x, since it has a square base, and then the height I've labeled h. All right? So we're told that the volume has to be 8 cubic meters. All right. The volume is length times width times height, which in this case is x times x times h, or x squared times h. All right. And this has to be 8 cubic meters. All right. So we have the set of all boxes that are 8 with square bases that are 8 cubic meters. We want to find the one that has the smallest surface area. All right. The surface area is then the function that we'll try to minimize, all right? So we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll write it out in terms of x and h, and then we'll use the volume equation to solve for one of the variables, all right? So the surface area is just the, I mean, it's, it's the area of every side added together. So a box has six sides. It has a top, a bottom, and then four side panels, all right? The top panel, so I'll just write that out, so top, top, bottom, and sides. The top and bottom both have area x squared. So I can combine that and write it as 2x squared, right? Because they're both the top and bottom are both squares, all right? And we've labeled the sides x. Uh, each side has a length of a x times h, right? Each side panel is just a, is just a rectangular with dimensions h and x. So since there's four of them, we end up with 4x times h. Okay, so this is our, our surface area, and this is the equation that we'll try to minimize. All right, and we'll do that first by solving for one of the variables. All right, um, I would never really want to like use a square root if I don't have to. So in this case, I think we should solve for h. All right, so we use the volume equation to solve for h equals 8 over x squared. OK? I assume it's OK. I can't see the chat. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So then we make this substitution. All right, so the surface area becomes a function of the single variable x. And we get 2x squared plus 4x times 8 over x squared. OK, simplifying this, we get 2x squared plus, so 4 times 8 is 32. x divided by x squared will just give me an x on the denominator. So we'll have 32 over x. All right, so this is our function that we're trying to minimize. We want to find a local min. All right, so we're going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. We're trying to find the critical points again. All right, so the derivative here the derivative of 2x squared is 4x. The derivative of 32 over x is minus 32 over x squared. All right, and we set that equal to zero. So I'm going to come back over here, stop sharing the screen. Uh, where's the file?
Okay, so we had 4x <laughs> minus 32 over x squared. Indeed, penmanship. Yes, this is the derivative of the uh, surface area equation. You can't see anything. Can you all see the sheet? Scroll up. Scroll down. Okay. Okay, and we set this equal to zero. All right, so then, and then we just solve for x, all right? So you just add um, one of the terms over to the other side. Uh, this actually has a nice solution. So then you would multiply the x squared over and divide by 4 to get x cubed equals 32 over 4, which is 8. All right, so then the cubic root of x of, of 8 is 2. <laughs> Can we have lectures with the cat in it or see it at the end? Um, I will try to show you the cat at the end. Maybe I'll just have a dedicated cat cam. Uh, the cat's name is Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any questions about about this problem? Probably a lot. What happened to the negative? So I added the 32 over x squared to the other side. All right, so when I add that over, I get rid of, you get rid of the negative. What was the solution to problem one? Uh, I believe x was the square root of 80 and y was 400 divided by the square root of 80. All right, so is x um, a local min? So you would, you would want to test that using a sign chart as well, basically. All right, so let's see. Okay, so I would want to plug in something to the left of 2 and something to the right of 2. So to the left of 2, I could plug in 1. And you plug this back into the derivative equation. All right, so my derivative equation is 4x minus 32 over x squared. Okay, so if I plug 1 into that, I just get 4 minus 32, which is negative. Okay, to the right, I could plug in, say, 4. That would be a nice value. So if I plug in 4, uh, I'd get 16 minus 2, which is 14. So to the right, I'd get something positive. All right, so this means my function goes from decreasing to increasing around 2. So you have a local min. All right, type, type one in the chat if that makes sense. Good, good, good. <laughs> okay, all right, so that's basically our review of um, optimization. So now we'll, we'll go back to review limits because that will that will lead us into L'Hopital's rule, uh, which will be the content of, of Wednesday and Fridays. Um, okay, so right, so which, which has the minimal surface area? So that's actually good. We didn't really kind of finish the question. So the one with the minimal surface area would have a base, a two by two base, um, two by two meters, and then the height 
would be determined by the volume equation, which was that x squared times h equals 8. So if x is 2, and you plug that back in to this equation and solve for h, you'll get 4 times h equals 8. So you get h equals um, 2 as well. All right. So the one with the minimal surface area is actually just a cube. Mm -hmm. OK. Cool, cool, cool. Ah, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, you still have to show work. Always have to show work. Yeah, x squared times h equals 8 is, is what I've written. It's what's circled. That's correct. All right, so that's all for optimization today. Uh, in the time we have left, we can look at uh, reviewing limits. OK, so there are certain um, there's, a, there's a rule called L'Hopital's rule, which we'll use to evaluate certain limits um, that we couldn't have evaluated earlier. All right. And these will be limits that take the form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Some, some of the times we were able to do this. All right. So like in all the cases here, at least in the first three cases, uh, we're able to. What was the minimal surface area? So each side length had length two. So you really, we just wanted the dimensions. So x and h were both two, right? And then if you actually wanted the surface area, you could you could plug those back into the original surface area equation. Okay. So um, so let's look at these limits, all right? And then we'll introduce L'Hopital's rule, and then that'll be that for today. We won't keep won't try to keep you too long, all right? So this should be just a review, at least the first couple. Um, the first one is the limit as x goes to infinity of x minus 1 over x plus 3. So if I just sort of naively plug, try to plug infinity into this, it'll just look like infinity over infinity. So this is an indeterminate form. Uh, the sheet is. It should be under my name in Blackboard. Uh, if you go to uh, course material by instructor, click on my name, and scroll all the way to the bottom, it should be there. Yeah, review of optimization and introduction to L'Hopital's rule. Uh, is there any way to print the lecture sheet? That depends on if you have a printer, I suppose. OK, so, so when we had a rational function like this and we were taking a limit going to uh, infinity, does anyone remember sort of how we did this? Can y'all not hear me? OK. Yeah, right. We divided by the highest degree. Good. All right. So in this case, these are both degree 1 uh, polynomials. So we'll just divide out by x, basically. We'll divide every term by x. All right. So this is going to look pretty bad. We'll take the limit as x approaches infinity. All right. Could be worse. Okay, 
So you divide everything out by X, all right? Are we going to see a completed lecture sheet? Yes, I'll, I'll handwrite a completed lecture sheet and post that to Blackboard after class sometime. Uh, you're right, it is X plus three, thank you. Okay, so X divided by X just gives us one. Minus one divided by X gives us minus one divided by X. All right, X divided by X again gives us one. And I should be writing the limit here, of course, um, but I'm running out of space, so that's my excuse. You have none. Uh, and then three over X is just that, three over X. Okay, so now if we take the limit as X goes to infinity of each of these terms, the constant terms remain just that, constant. And each term with an X in the denominator uh, will go to zero. So the one over X term goes to zero, the three over X term goes to zero, and you just end up with one over one, all right, which is just one. Good, good, good. All right, so for the next one, so you multiply, yeah, I multiplied every term by one over X, basically, yes. Uh, one over X does indeed go to zero if I plug infinity into it, um, but we were just using it to simplify the expression or write re-expression in a different way, right? So X minus one over X plus three and this expression are the same, except for when x is zero, right? But since we're taking a limit going to infinity, I don't really care what it looks like when it's zero. Yeah, that is, a, that is indeed a one. All right, I would erase, but this Blackboard app erases everything when you erase, all right? Genius. All right, so let's look at the next one. So we have the limit as x approaches 9 of root x minus 3 over x minus 9. So if I just plug 9 into this, uh, I don't I don't think, I don't want to do it right now, but I don't think it works. Um, but I could try it, I suppose, later. Um, so if you plug 9 into this, you'll just get 0 over 0, right? Because if I plug 9 in, yeah, exactly. So you'll get 0 over 0. So this is another indeterminate form. Okay, zero over zero doesn't mean that it's undefined or anything like that. Okay, it just means we don't have enough information basically to solve it. Um, so we had some techniques to uh, evaluate this. So in this case, when we had a square root, what technique did we use? Yeah, I'm not gonna hit all of F4. Conjugate, right? We multiplied the top and bottom by the conjugate. Okay, so we multiplied the top and bottom by root x plus three. And then this would become, so actually maybe I will erase this. Okay, so we multiplied the top and bottom by the conjugate. All right, no, that's not working, cool. <laughs> Oh, not what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. This um, will have the effect of, of canceling something out, hopefully. So root x plus 3 times root x minus 3 will give me a factor of x minus 9 on the top. Jeez.
The numerator is, is x minus 9, yeah. So that comes from multiplying the root x minus 3 times root x plus 3. If you cross, if you FOIL those out, the cross terms will cancel out. Root x times root x is x, and 3 times negative 3 is 9. All right, so this has the effect of canceling out sort of the offending term in the denominator, the x minus 9. And then we're just left with the limit as x approaches 9 of 1 over root x plus 3. Okay, now I can just plug 9 in. There's nothing, there's no issue here. All right, yeah, so you get 1 sixth, right? If I plug 9 in, the square root of x or the square root of 9 is 3. So I have 1 over 3 plus 3. Okay, any questions on that? Got it, got it. Makes sense, makes sense. That's, <laughs> it may indeed be. All right, Emiliano, you have your hand up. Only if it's in my fridge. All right. Here's the cat. <laughs> Jimmy. All right, that's enough. All right, so so I think I think that that'll, that'll be all for today. Uh, um, next time we'll we'll go over L'Hopital's rule, which will let us um, which will allow us to evaluate a larger a larger class of limits. Okay, like this one minus ln x over x squared. Nothing else. Nothing we've learned thus far would really allow us to evaluate this limit. Um, but we'll we'll introduce this rule called L'Hopital's rule, which uses derivatives, um, which will allow us to do that. Okay, so. So that's all. Thank you for joining me. Um, remember to like and subscribe. Uh, what else? All right. Thank you as well. <laughs> Fast trying to eat my sandwich. All right. So I'll actually be having office hours now, I guess. So I, I will just keep the, the chat, or I'm sorry, the, the session open. All right. All right. So I'll see you all on Wednesday. Please just email me. Uh, if you have any other questions. All right, thanks. Oh, yeah, Alejandro, I, I saw your email. I'll, I'll get back to you.
Uh, the modules will be posted on Blackboard, if you mean the quizzes. Uh, the, this lecture is is being recorded as we speak. Uh, presumably, there's some way to log the lectures and post them later. I'm not exactly sure how, but, but we'll figure that out for sure. Uh, I'll be on here till till five, I suppose. Okay, so written homework one. Let's see if I can I can like bring that up. No, that's okay. I can I can bring it up on here. Uh, I can turn mics on too. You have a. Uh, can you see it, Anam? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so so what's your question? Um, I think I enabled mic, so you could you could talk if you like. Oh. If I can, I don't know if I can hear you. Uh, I have a problem the in a the A part. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're trying to find uh, an equation that describes the area of this rectangle. Okay. Okay. So 
like uh, half of the bottom side, mm -hmm. or let's say, let's look at like a point here, All right? So the point where the rectangle touches the parabola, this has mm -hmm. coordinates. X comma Y. X, Y. Uh, and y is determined by this, like we, we, we know what y is basically because it has to, that at this point, the rectangle is touching the parabola, okay? And the parabola has the equation y equals 5 minus, uh, I cannot hear you. Um, hmm. Uh, let me see. Hello? Let me look at the settings again. Can you again. hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hmm. Uh, does the little mic like on the bottom light up when you talk? Yeah. Mine's not right now. I don't know why. It's on actually, but still it's not working, I think. It's not working. That's okay. Um, mm. So, but but basically the idea is you have so you have this rectangle which is inside of this parabola, huh. and at the corners it touches the parabola. So it has to have yeah. the same the same coordinates like at that point, like the parabola and the rectangle. So since the parabola is given by this equation, this five minus one fifth x squared, um, that will be the y coordinate of that point as well. Okay, so that, that will be the height of the rectangle, basically. The y coordinate of that corner point is the height of the rectangle, right? And then x is one half of the base. It's just that part of the base has length x. So the full length of the base of the rectangle is 2x, okay? So the func the area is base times height. And in this case, it's 2x times 5 minus 1 fifth x squared. So you could write it, I'll, I'll type it in the chat, 2x times 5 minus 1 fifth uh, x squared. So the base has length 2x and the height 
just comes from the equation of the parabola, which is five minus one fifth x squared. Yeah. <laughs> So that's your area function. And you could distribute the 2x to write it as, so 5 times 2x is 10x. And then when I multiply the 2x times 1 fifth x squared, I'll have minus 2 fifths x cubed. So I just distributed the 2x to the 5 and the minus 1 fifth x squared. Mm -hmm. uh, not for part A. That, that's, a, that's fine for part A. Yeah, so for part B, you take the derivative of that. Okay. So for part C, you finish the optimization problem. So you'll you'll set you'll set the derivative equal to zero, and then solve for it the same way we did with the first two questions uh, on the lecture today. So you'll compute the derivative in part B, and then you'll find the critical points of the that function. So you'll set the derivative equal to zero and solve for x. Uh, I think probably you'll get a single answer, and then you'll you'll you could use a sign chart to test whether that's a, a local min or a local max okay yeah so coming coming up with the equation especially for this question for this question is the hardest part mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so let's look at question two. Okay. So let me read through this real quick. A group of people wished to charter a boat for a voyage around the world. Uh, the, char the charter company with which they were negotiating charged a fee of $1,000 per person for groups of 100 or people or less and decrease the fee by $5 per person more than 100. OK, um, the charter company has flat expenses of $40, $40 plus an additional $200 per passenger. In this problem, you will determine how many passengers would have maximized the charter company's profits had everything not gone haywire. All right, so profit is revenue minus cost. Um, we want to find a formula for the profit as a function of the number of people, which is valid when there are 100. OK, so first doing it for, um, which is valid when there are 100 passengers or fewer. Is the revenue ever decreasing in this range? So if there's fewer than 100 passengers, uh, it always costs them $1,000 per person. So 
So the revenue is just a thousand times in. Just a thousand times the number of people. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, the cost is a flat expense of $40,000 and an additional $200 per passenger. So the cost is $40,000 plus $200 per passenger. So the profit is revenue minus cost. which would be 1,000 times N minus 40,000 plus 200 times N. And this will come out to 800 times N uh, minus 40,000. Right, the derivative of this would tell us whether it's increasing or decreasing. So the derivative of this profit function would just be 800. So it's always increasing. It's always a positive value. Okay. And then you come up with a different equation um, for part B when there's more than 100, because in that case, the revenue is different, right? Because then they start giving you a $5 discount per person uh, more than 100. For part B, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for part B, the cost function is the same. They don't they don't mention anything special about the cost function uh, if it's above 100 people, but the revenue function will be different. So the revenue is cost per person times the number of people. Uh, from from making the subtraction, so it's a thousand in minus this term forty thousand plus two hundred in. So when I subtract, when I distribute the negative, I'd get a thousand in minus forty thousand minus two hundred in. So a thousand in minus two hundred in gives me the eight hundred in. I'm just combining like terms essentially. Yeah.
Uh, no, the last line is still for the first part. The, the last question, well, I mean, it's still for part A. The, the last question is, is the revenue ever decreasing in this range? So we have an equation for the revenue, which is 800 in minus 40,000. Uh, whether this quantity, yeah, we just took the derivative of the profit function and got 800, which is a positive value, so it's always increasing. So for part C, you'll have to find the maximum. So you'll look at um, you'll look at your answers in part A and B, and kind of like try to like find out where a maximum would occur. All right. So you'll you'll try to find critical points over the whole domain. So like from zero to infinity, like how many people are are doing it. So. Over the first part, there's not really a critical point because the derivative is just this constant um, 800. Uh, once you get an equation for part B, you can see if there's a, cr a critical point greater than that. Otherwise, since this is piecewise, um, you would you would also want to test like what is a what is the cost at 100? So like 100 will basically be a critical point because probably your function is not differentiable there. Okay. No problem.